Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, so um, thank you for coming to listen to my talk this afternoon. Um, so I'm Simon Marshall and I'll be talking about the cohomology of arithmetic groups and arithmetic manifolds. And this is um, it's a very interesting subject that sort of has interactions with geometry, um, representation theory and number theory. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you little flavours of some of these things in the next 20 minutes. So um, I think before I can define an arithmetic, well, an arithmetic lattice or an arithmetic manifold, really, I'd better define what a locally symmetric space is. Um, so, and to do that, I first got to define what a globally symmetric space is. So the first definition, globally symmetric space X, well, there's, there's sort of a, a first natural definition of this in terms of Ramanian geometry, but these things were classified by Cartan, and so now I'm just going to give you the definition, you know, which is much simpler following Cartan's classification. So a globally symmetric space is the quotient sorry, of non-compact type. I should just put a little asterisk there, or of negatively curved type. is a quotient G mod K, where G is a semi-simple Lie group, and K and G is the maximal compact subgroup. So probably the canonical example of such things are the hyperbolic spaces HN. So when I, when I write this definition, you can think of G as the isometry group of X and K as the stabilizer of a point. So hyperbolic space has a nice semi-simple isometry group, the group SON1. The stabilizer of a point is SON. So this is the way in which I can think of hyperbolic space as a locally symmetric space. Oh, sorry, it's a globally symmetric space. Um, and then having defined that, the second definition I can make a locally symmetric space M is the quotient of a globally symmetric space by some discrete group of isometries. So for X globally symmetric and gamma and G discrete. Um, so for example, all hyperbolic manifolds are examples of locally symmetric spaces. Um, okay. What I want to say. So it's so a natural question that you can ask is, let's say, assume that M has finite volume or even that it's compact. Um, what can we say about the cohomology groups of M, say with complex coefficients, just for simplicity. Um, so, you know, there are examples where we, we understand these things very well. Say, if in the case of hyperbolic two space and compact M, this is just a Riemann surface, and we understand the cohomology of these perfectly. Um, on the other hand, if we make this just a little bit more complicated, if we go to, say, a hyperbolic three manifold, then suddenly things are far less well understood. Um, and in fact, we have the following open, conje open conjecture of Thurston. If M is a compact hyperbolic three manifold, does there exist a finite cover M prime of M with first sorry, with non-trivial first cohomology, and there are there are lots and lots of examples where we know um, that the answer to this is positive, but it's still not known in general. So there are sort of very very subtle questions that you know cases where this question is very very subtle. Um, Let's see. So the first tool that I want to sort of talk about applying to this problem 
is the representation theory of the Lie group G. Um, and so sort of to motivate, to motivate where the representation theory comes in, if we have a cohomology class in Hi of M for some I, by Hodge theory that corresponds to a differential I form on M which is harmonic. So there's, there's some Laplacian that you can find on, define on differential I forms. It's a generalization of the usual Laplacian on functions. And um, in fact, the ith cohomology of, of a compact manifold M is isomorphic to the space of smooth differential I forms, which are killed by this Laplacian. Um, so in particular, this sort of the cohomology of M is you know, somehow encoded in the spectral theory of M. So there's, there's a very nice general object which is of great importance in number theory in which I think David and Andre have already talked about in their lectures, um, which is the space of square integrable functions on gamma mod G, which will turn out to sort of capture all of this stuff and much else. So the thing we can, well, the reason this is a nice object to consider is, so G acts on gamma mod G from the right. And because G was semi-simple, it preserves the Haar measure, or the Haar volume, on the space. And so we get a unitary representation of G on L2 gamma mod G. And so if we assume that M was compact, then we get as a consequence of this that this representation decomposes as an irreducible direct sum of the elements in the unitary dual of G, so this, this G hat is the unitary dual, it's the set of isomorphism classes of irreducible unitary representations of G, and all of these, well, almost all of these guys have to be infinite dimensional, um, occurring with some multiplicity, which I'm going to call N gamma pi. So just to, to give you a little bit of intuition about what this sort of decomposition means, if I take a, a representation pi and I assume that pi contains a function phi which is fixed by the maximal compact, then so phi is a function on gamma mod g which is invariant under the right by k so it descends to m, this manifold. And the fact that I assumed pi was irreducible means that phi is actually a Laplace eigenfunction. So this decomposition is somehow capturing the spectral theory of the manifold m and in particular it sort of captures all of these harmonic differential forms. So what that means, or well, I mean formally what you can prove that kind of reflects this, is that there are special classes of representations of G which are called representations of cohomological type. And each of these representations contributes to the cohomology of M in certain degrees with, with certain multiplicities. So for instance, say the constant function lives in this L2 space and that generates, you know, that's an irreducible representation. Um, and that corresponds to the constant function on M which is, you know, represents the class in H0. So this is sort of fancier, fancier generalizations of this. Okay, so um, so there's a result, or in fact a classification of all of these cohomological representations um, so this was done by Vogan and Zuckerman Um, and so we understand this, this set of cohomological representations completely and we can use this to get some very surprising vanishing results for the cohomology of these, these locally symmetric spaces because what you, what you do is you say, well, okay, let's take, I don't know, let's say, let G be group SL 
for r. And suppose that we've, we've gone through this classification of cohomological representations for g, and there's no unitary representation which contributes to the h1. So that means any locally symmetric space, so compact locally symmetric space that I make out of g mod k can't have any first homology. And so this is, you can sort of go through and do this for um, all the semi-simple Lie groups and the vanishing result, so you get a very nice vanishing result based on this. And so to define this, I just need to define something called the rank. So the rank R of a locally symmetric space is the dimension of the largest flat totally geodesic subspace. So for instance, if we're in hyperbolic space, the only totally geodesic subspaces of hyperbolic spaces are smaller hyperbolic spaces. And these are only flat when they're geodesic lines. So the rank of any hyperbolic space is 1. Um, more generally, what you can show is, th well, what turns out to be true is that the rank of x turns out to be the dimension of the largest split torus of g. So in other words, rank of x equals, um, how do I say this, n, oh, so the maximum of n such that g has a subgroup isomorphic to r cross to the n. So for SLNR, for instance, the biggest such subgroup is the group of diagonal matrices. And this has dimension n minus 1. So the rank of the locally of SLNR or the locally symmetric space associated to that equals n minus 1. So that's that's the definition of the rank of a locally symmetric space and all its so sorry, of a globally symmetric space and all its associated locally symmetric spaces. And so the theorem, again, as a consequence of Vogelman Zuckerman's classification, so Hi of M is trivial for I bigger than zero and less than the rank of M. Um, and there are cases when you can actually go even further with this. So there's, there's a very nice example. I guess you mean the triplet comes from the future, not from the future. Uh, yeah, so no, I think. Uh, oh, yes, that's true. Sorry. So other than the contributions from. Yeah, so there, there are certain degrees in which the trivial representation makes contributions. But these are kind of very, very simple to understand um, and sort of don't really reflect the, the geometry of this in any way. Um, right, let's see. So that's sort of an idea of what you can say about this problem just using representation theory. Um, so now I'd like to introduce a little bit of um, sort of a little bit of number theory, and show you what sort of you can prove using methods methods like that, and particularly to define what an arithmetic manifold is. Um, so an arithmetic manifold is sort of one of these locally symmetric guys where where gamma is constructed using number theory, more or less. Um, so kind of the Again, the most natural example is if we take G to be SLNR and gamma to be the group of matrices with integer entries. Um, 
So the general definition is, say we want to take an algebraic group A over Q, and we want the real points of this group to be isomorphic to the semi-simple Lie group we want, possibly cross some compact factors, which we can forget about. So then what we do is, to, so this is our group, to make a lattice in here, we take the set of, well, if we think of this as say a matrix group, we take the matrices with integer entries, and that lies inside A of R, and then we just project that onto G. So this gives us a lattice gamma and G. So a gamma constructed like this is called arithmetic, and any, and more generally, anything which is commensurable with such a gamma is also called arithmetic. So commensurability means the intersection is a finite index in both groups. Okay, so. So arithmetic manifolds have lots, you know, a large amount of additional structure um, coming, a large amount of additional structure to them. Um, and to briefly illustrate this, I'll just quickly recall some of the constructions, say, that David and Andre uh, introduced last week. So they introduced the space... Well, so first of all, if, we, if we're working over the rationals, they introduce this ring A, which is the product of the reals times the piadic numbers for every P. And then they took a quotient, say if we're working with the group GLN, they took a quotient GLNQ modulo GLN A modulo the product of GLN of the piadic integers at every prime p. And so they, well, they might not have had this part so much, but they looked at this quotient and they looked at certain kinds of nice functions on this space, and these were expected to correspond to Galois representations. So what it turns out is that this space is actually isomorphic to, more or less, to the things that we've been talking about already. Um, so this is isomorphic to GLNZ modulo GLNR. And so if we sort of mod out by the center and forget about the determinants of things, this is the same as, say, a locally symmetric space associated to SLNR and SLNZ. In fact, it turns out that... Um, so, a so a cohomological representation occurring in gamma mod G that I've described so far actually turns out to be an example of an algebraic automorphic representation in the sense of number theory. And so these things are expected to have Galois representations associated to them. Um, so in particular, what this means So in particular what this means is because, you know, if we have a map from, from one group into the other, so if we have a map from GL2 to GL3, and if we have a Galois representation into this group, we should be able to compose it to, with that and get a Galois representation into GL3. So we should be able to kind of transfer these cohomology classes between different groups. Um, and this is sort of roughly what the functoriality principle is all about. Um, and we, we don't you know, know this in general, but there's sort of a baby version of this which is still very useful for the purposes of constructing cohomology classes on arithmetic manifolds, and this is the theta lift. So, yeah. so the, the theta lift is kind of a, a baby version of a functorial transfer, and I guess I'll just finish by quickly describing some of the non-vanishing results that we can prove using using this tool. So this is 
Um, this was really well exploited by Zhang Shu Li to work on all sorts of arithmetic manifolds, but I'll just describe his results in the case of hyperbolic spaces. So if gamma in SON1 is arithmetic and n is at least 6, then let's see, there exists a finite index subgroup gamma prime and gamma such that the locally symmetric space associated to gamma prime has positive first homology. Um, so this is an example. So again, so what, what he does is use the theta lift to um, can take an automorphic form on a, on a smaller group of the type that we can understand and map it into this big group. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we're, we're very much interested in doing in general, say, because there's sort of a principle that, at least on, on arithmetic manifolds, most of the cohomology should be coming from smaller groups in this way. And so if we sort of understood these, these functorial transfers better, we'd be able to know sort of how much cohomology these arithmetic manifolds have, how much it's growing in towers. Um, yeah, it would, it would really give us a lot of information. So um, I think I'd better stop there, but thanks for your time.